inflation in the United States has hit 5% for three months in a row. And yet Jeff Snyder, head of global research for Alhambra Partners, recently wrote a blog post that said there are hints of transitory in the numbers. Here's the title, inflation more than hints transitory, more than hints, Jeff. We are going to ask you to explain how can this be? August 11th, 2021 is when you wrote this. And we're going to start out with the non-seasonally adjusted full index, which increased by 5.37% year over year for July. And where do you want to go from there? What, how did your analysis progress from there? Well, what more than hints at transitory is that it the numbers exhibit already some transitory nature so that's that's one thing the other thing is again let's let's state our premise perfectly so people can understand where we're coming from this is not inflation inflation is not a temporary price deviation because we've seen these time and again as we just talked about in our previous uh, previous uh, segment the cpi had hit three five percent three months in a row almost five percent four months in a row in the summer of 2008 Again, in 2000, late 2010, 2011, the CPI was relatively high. Nobody would confuse those periods with inflationary periods. And the reason is because they weren't. You can see prices deviate and go up and down all over the place. And you can have these temporary uh, periods where the CPI is high. And it still doesn't mean it's inflation because inflation is a monetary phenomenon. And if the monetary system is overabundant to the point that it's causing excessiveness in consumer prices, what we would then expect to see is a broad base, which means more than just a few prices, a broad base sustained increase in consumer prices for more than a couple months here or there, even, even a year. We would expect it to see what's happened year over year, which I understand most people are saying, yeah, we get it. That's what we're that's what we're expecting is going to happen for 2021 and 2022 and 2023. All of these years are what we're saying is this is the beginning, the start of a period where inflation is going to be it's going to be huge for a long time. And what we're saying is, as we've just went through in the previous segment, these historical episodes, is no, that's not likely to be the case because to have that sustained inflation year after year from 2021 into 2022 you would actually have to have monetary excessiveness, which we're telling you, the system itself is telling us that that's such a small probability, that the deflationary potential is so high, that it's reasonable to conclude that this is kind of it, that once this temporary price deviation runs its course, we're gonna go back into the same disinflationary quote unquote puzzle as we had been in since 2000, well, really going back to the first financial crisis. Uh, let's see. Okay. Yes. Bills are telling us that inflationary potential, not great, but if the consumer price basket was broadly increasing, well, then we would have to reconsider. We'd have to say, Hmm, maybe, maybe something else is happening. And in these most recent, uh, most recent report, you point out that it's energy and autos that is really supercharging these numbers, Jeff, I assumed it was broad based. I think everyone watching is assuming that it's a broad base increase in consumer prices. Tell us you saw just energy and autos or other things, but really being driven by those two. Yeah, it's other things. Again, you know, there's two de two pieces of the definition for inflation here. We just talked about the one which is sustained over a long period of time as a mo as a as a consequence of monetary excessiveness. The other one is broad based. It's not to just the food prices go up and nothing else does. It's not just that, you know, prices for health care goes up, but not really much else does. It's where the prices of food, health care and autos and everything else goes up all at the same time. And what we're seeing, I wish, you know, the PCE deflator is much better because they have the trim mean version of it, where you can really see the differences here. But by and large, you know, yes, consumer prices are much higher than they were last year. Some of that is base effects. Some of that is legitimate price increases in somewhat of a broad based fashion. But by and large, this the spike spikiness of the, the uh, last couple months is due to autos and energy. The autos in particular, especially used car prices are up something like 40 some percent year over year. Even new car prices in the CPI were up six something percent, which was the highest in almost 40 years. So those are really pushing the CPI 
Whereas other prices, yes, they're up, but they're not up as much. And then you have, of course, oil and energy and gasoline, which people are very well aware of. What about the CPI core rate, Jeff? That suggests a slightly different picture, doesn't it? Yeah, so if we start to step back away from these these narrow channels where the CPI is most extreme, we can start by stripping out food and energy prices, which you know, people say, well, you can't live without food or gasoline. Yeah, we get it. But the, again, what we're trying to analyze here is inflation according to its definition. And it's not just a definition for academic terms. It's definitions that tell you whether or not this stuff is going to be sustained. Because if it can't meet these definitions, then it's not really inflation, which means it's not really going to be sustained. So we're, it sounds like we're being economists here. But we're actually pulling these pieces apart so that we can get at what we think is the truth. And so if we start stepping back away from these narrow components that are driving the headline spikes, start with the core inflation rate, which strips out food and energy, you know, the, the monthly change in the seasonally adjusted index for July was relatively high, but not nearly as high as it has been. And so mm -hmm. there's already an indication that, okay, maybe when we get away from food and energy prices, that still has autos, that still has used cars and used cars in it, but it's not as robust and as the headline had been. 4.4%. I don't know what I, I need to drink. I'm having a tough time speaking. <laughs> yeah, it, it, or maybe, you've been, you've, maybe maybe it's, there's too much rum flowing from Jamaica. I mean, you're really close to highly Jamaica unlikely. there. And... Highly unlikely too much rum. 4.47% core CPI in June, 427 in July, rate of change. Hedgei, Keith McCullough, they can't stop talking about it. It's so important to them. They always make that point. Yeah. It's the rate of change that's Second very important. Second derivative, gamma, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, it, it is It is an important. So, yeah, 4.27 is still high, hmm. but it's substantially less than what, it's significantly less than what it was the, the months before. So rate of change is changing, maybe changing. Of course, you never want to go off of one month, but we're not going off of one month as we're going to see here. Yes. So you have the headline CPI that was down two basis points from where it was in June. You have the core CPI down 20 basis points from where it was in June. And then we get to an other components that don't have that, that uh, used car, new car, com new car uh, bucket that's really, really driving the CPI. And you start to really see transitory develop. I have, so I have pulled up the seasonally adjusted month over month change in inflation, core inflation. Then this graph really shows it, Jeff, doesn't it? It starts. I think this is where it starts. And I think what's also important is what I've labeled there is you can see what's really going on here. You can see why prices get pushed up as much as they hit. We did this last year. People have forgotten already, but we did this last year in miniature when the first round of helicopter payments from the treasury hit the hit people's pocketbooks, some of that got spent, some of that got immediately released in the economy. Added add to that, the, you know, the first initial phase of reopening after the COVID overreactions, and suddenly you had this positive force, but it didn't last very long, mm. because why would it? It's, it's a one, it was a one-time shot in the arm, you know, government paying people because they were harmed by a recession that was nothing of their own making, certainly not their fault, but that's not the same as economic stimulus. It was a one-time a, a one time event and the the necessary uh, results from it were transitory or temporary. Now we're seeing the same thing again happen early 2000, uh, 2021, especially in March when that second helicopter payment really hit. What happens? We see the same thing again. Prices spike, activity, all that stuff goes up in the goods economy. But then what? Once the once the helicopter payment starts to recede into history, why would we expect it to continue to have lasting effects when we just we already saw last year that it didn't, and we already know underlying the real economy is it's really not that great. So there really isn't a, there really isn't a situation where we expect anything other than temporary effects. Now there's another measure that you very rarely hear about, but I, in this article you say that it's a another core measure and it's services less rent of shelter and you describe it as important very strong compelling indication jeff i'm showing the graph right now tell us why is this important compelling very strong indication 
what we've just talked about. We're trying to get at the the in, the uh, the real substance of the economy, not away from you know these 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 narrow channels where prices are really are going up. So we get away from the goods economy, get away from used car prices, for example. We get away from energy and start looking at CPI services, which is a key component rate about underlying inflation potential, and it really does exhibit that transitory. Um, you know, the, the kind of a snake-like uh, pattern in the chart, which shows you the month of over a month changes pretty much. Hey, it's not just this month where we're seeing transitory pressures starting to, 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 you know, these transitory things starting to fade. It's actually for the third straight month where outside of autos and energy and gasoline and food, the underlying, the rest of the global, the rest of the U.S. economy is starting to fall back into that same disinflationary state that it had been in for many, many years before. You said global there. It slipped out. We're going to talk yeah, about the global out. picture in a second. <laughs> I, I definitely, that's a key point. But I wanted to double check if this is right, Jeff, because this is really hard to believe. I think maybe it's a typo. Quote, rising only 0.09% compared to June and we're talking about, again, CPI services excluding rent. This wasn't just the lowest single month increase since January. It was also one of the lowest single month increases, period. Is that right, Jeff? Yeah, it's not. You don't usually see that um, small of a monthly change. And if you go back to the wow. chart, you can see it on the chart. Yes. So, yeah, July, outside of used cars and energy and food and all these other things, price, price of the price environment isn't no isn't anywhere near as um accelerating robust whatever adjective you want to throw in there as it had been over those couple months you know march and then really april was the peak and then may and june what we're seeing is what you exactly what we had expected you can go back to the podcast history here we kept saying that we thought this would be transitory and lo and behold, it's playing out in exactly that way. Not just markets, not just you know treasury yields and global bond yields, but we're seeing this, this play out in the actual inflation data, just as you would expect it to play out. Here's a key sentence that summarizes this article in the show. Combined with continued deceleration, the farther out you get away from those effects and you start to see the trend develop more and more. Services less rent peaks in April, the core also April, but breaks in July. And now the headline begins to break down from the cumulative quickening. So we, we've, we're seeing it. We think, okay, maybe in isolation, if we just saw just this data, we could say, well, we don't know yet. But we see treasury bills suggesting also a deceleration, a, a poor monetary condition. And earlier you said global, Jeff. What's happening in Europe, Japan, China, Britain? Are any of those countries signaling rip-roaring inflation? Or are they also corroborating the message we see out of Treasury bills and this inflection in CPI? Yeah, and that's, and that's another indication that, um, that the U.S. consumer prices are being outliers, extreme outliers. As we said before, I think we've shown the graph before, if you graph um, the US PCE deflator version of inflation against the European HICP version of inflation, up until around February, March of this year, they had been very closely correlated. And then all of a sudden US prices, they just explode upward. Whereas around the rest of the world, everybody's like, what inflation? inflation? There's no inflation here. China, uh, inflation, Never Dreadful. got more than 1.3%, and yes. now that's starting to decelerate in exactly the same fashion. The Japanese barely got to the plus sign. Um, they're still more negative than positive. And the Europeans, as I said, Europe, even with all of the base effects in their numbers, still only got to, continent-wide, still only got to about 2.2% HICP, which is you know half the rate for the PCE deflator and less than half the rate of the CPI. So U.S. consumer prices, again, if we're, if we're if we're coming up with a definition of inflation, sustained, the market says not much potential for it to be sustained. Broad-based, when we, when we break down the data, it's not really so broad-based as maybe we, we're led to believe. And then there's this global component to it, which is inflation is really a global monetary phenomenon, not a domestic U.S. dollar phenomenon. So if we're not seeing inflation come up in all of these places around the world, it's another 
check mark against the idea that inflation in the U.S. is going to be some sustained monster a la the great inflation of the 1970s. In other words, should inflation rates continue to play out as they have, each simply the predictable results of, yes, transitory factors having their day and then fading away into ugly history. From supply problems to base effects and mostly Uncle Sam, these aren't permanent changes to the situation. Jeff, earlier I mentioned Britain. And in part three, we're going to discuss Britain and their inflation situation, but in a broader overview of how their central bank has functioned, worked, and the big, big, big change in 1998. 